All right, so uh, today we're diving back into uh, aviation weather here. Uh, last time we left off talking about the uh, structure and the development of low pressure systems, cold fronts, warm fronts, all that good stuff. And how they lay over or fall over each other and yep. make thunderstorms. Precisely, precisely. Today we're going to pick back up here with chapter 11 um, and we're going to talk about uh, vertical motion of air cloud formation. So we talked a little bit about that uh, in the sense of frontal activity last time, but uh, we're going to go into a little bit more depth about that uh, here today. So um, as we kind of talked about last time, um, when we have vertical movement of air, um, that is what leads to a lot of the cloud formation. We talked about it in terms of on um, the front of a cold front, how the, the uh, cold front uh, pushes air up and causes uh, that water vapor to condense out and form clouds and how that can lead to thunderstorms. Um, but there are other uh, ways that, that can uh, happen as well. Um, one of the uh, very common ways is through solar heating. We also talked about that before. Um, now, as a uh, parcel of air gets lifted either by uh, solar heating or by um, frontal activity, either one, uh, the temperature obviously goes down. We talked about that, that uh, cooling as the air expands last time, it's adiabatic cooling. Um, but as that happens, uh, of course, the temperature goes down, um, but the, uh, the dew point, uh, in, uh, which is an indicator of how much water vapor is actually in the air, um, stays closer to constant. It does go down a little bit, but uh, stays much closer to constant as you lift that uh, parcel of air. And as the temperature goes down, the dew point stays relatively stable. Uh, when you get to the point where the uh, temperature and the dew point uh, meet, uh, once again that uh, water vapor condenses out of the air and forms a cloud. So here in figure 11-2, you they have an example. So the air at the surface, um, the temperature is 18 degrees. In this case, they're talking in Celsius. The dew point is 13 degrees. Um, and so we have a temperature dew point spread of 5 degrees Celsius, 73% humidity, and they say the air is unsaturated because it is not at the capacity of the air to retain moisture. As we lift the air, um, the temperature starts to go down, so uh, the first uh, level here as we lift it uh, a thousand feet, uh, in this case uh, the temperature goes down three degrees Celsius, the dew point goes down by half a degree. So the temperature dew point spread goes from five degrees to two and a half degrees, and the relative humidity goes from 73% up to 85%. When we get to 2,000 feet in this example, uh, the temperature has fallen from 18 degrees to 12 degrees, and the uh, dew point is only reduced from 13 to 12. So at this point, the temperature dew point spread is zero, or the temperature and dew point are the same, uh, which means our relative humidity is at 100% and the air is saturated, and that is where the base of our clouds usually form. So, uh, and again, as we talked about um, uh, last time, the more uh, violently that air gets lifted, the more violent weather we're going to have when it reaches that saturation point. Okay, question. I get how they match and that's where the base of the cloud starts. Right. That, that I understand. So the cloud starts here, ends here. What makes it, where, what's the science behind it having a top? What's, where does the top, what causes the top to stop creating clouds higher up? Uh, is, I don't know if it's covered here, but it's kind of Essentially, uh, how much lifting force you have. So the, as uh, the more violently the air gets lifted or the more strongly the air gets lifted, 
um, the taller the clouds are like that's to why be. thunderstorms go up so high exactly and that's why we talked about when a warm front comes through uh, air gets lifted very slowly by that warm front and that's why you have very flat clouds they're usually they're flat on the bottom they're flat on the top and they usually don't extend they're not real thick real thick because the air is being lifted so much more slowly that when it uh, when the water vapor condenses out of the air um, that will s essentially stop the air from rising anymore mm -hmm. and if it's not being lifted very quickly it'll just stop there and create a nice uh, fairly thin very flat layer whereas if it's being lifted quickly or strongly violently it will uh, you know keep going upwards and that's what causes those clouds to sort of bubble over and get puffy and tall. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now they also talk here about orographic uh, lifting or uh, lifting of air as it uh, blows over the ground, which we didn't talk about much last time. Um, so here in figure 11-4 uh, you see the uh, you have wind blowing up a slope, in this case looks like probably a mountain or something, and as the air gets lifted by the ground, uh, it will reach a point where that temperature dew point spread reaches zero and we get condensation. In this uh, figure, they call that the lifting condensation level. As the air continues to blow up the slope, uh, that will continue to lift the air and you'll get clouds from a certain point on the the uh, slope or the mountain all the way up to the top and that's why uh, very often in mountainous areas you'll see uh, mountains that are enveloped in clouds above a certain level because that wind is blowing up the slope uh, and at the certain point where the temperature comes down to meet the dew point you get that condensation. It's just you like get... a little wrap around the mountain. Exactly. Now as that happens um, <clears throat> the air keeps getting lifted so the, the condensation is going to continue and that often will form rain so the the windward side of mountains will tend to be rainier and wetter than the leeward side or the downwind side of mountains um, and this can cause an effect called a rain shadow where uh, you have an area downwind of a mountain range that can be very dry, uh, that can lead to desert. So for example, um, in uh, areas like Nevada, certain parts of Arizona, um, they're on the downwind side of the Rocky Mountains, so they're, they're in that rain shadow. So all the, the rain tends to fall in uh, California and the very... Uh, oh, California's lucky it falls. Right. <laughs> uh, California and the very western parts of Nevada uh, as the as that mm -hmm. air hits the Rocky Mountains, and by the time it gets to eastern Nevada and Arizona, kind of area, um, and even into western Colorado, um, the air has already deposited most of its moisture, so that's mm -hmm. why they don't get nearly as much rain in places like that. Um, but it also explains why the snow ski slopes in the Denver area are so packed with snow when a thousand feet down it's green. Exactly. Because it's right at that line there in the mountains where it's making the snow and rain all the time from the rising air around the mountain. Right. And as obviously as the wind comes back down the, the leeward side of the mountain, uh, that temperature goes back up. Uh, the dew point is now lower than it used to be because uh, it, the air has already deposited all its moisture. So in this figure 11-4, the air on the windward side of the mountain, they have a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius, a dew point of 10, so the relative humidity is 80%. Um, by the time it gets to the top, uh, temperature goes down to negative 7, and the dew point is also negative 7 because it's been lifted past uh, that condensation level, and so the relative humidity obviously is 100%. Now, as, you, as the wind comes down the, the uh, leeward side or the downwind side, um, that uh, war air warm adiabatically, so as it comes down it gets compressed by more air pressure at lower altitude and as we talked about the ideal gas law uh, in the last session, as, ga as a gas, in this case air, gets compressed, it temperature goes up. So 
as the wind or as the air comes down the uh, downwind side of the mountain, by the time it gets to the bottom here in this example, they have a uh, temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. And uh, the dew point, although it has picked up a little bit of moisture, is still negative 2. So the relative humidity is only 33%. So on the downwind side of a mountain range, you tend to have not very many clouds. You tend to have not as much rain um, and generally uh, less uh, violent uh, thunderstorms and phenomena like that. Um, in 11-6 uh, here, figure 11-6, uh, they're talking once again about that cold front and that frontal lifting that we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how that leads to uh, more vertical development of clouds. Uh, so that's uh, a little bit more about uh, development of clouds, what causes uh, rain to fall more in, more often in some areas than in others. Um, now, another important aspect to this is uh, the stability of the air. So what, we, what do we mean when we say stability of the air? Well, uh, if you take a parcel of air and you lift that air and uh, it's temper the temperature of that air as it cools ends up being still cooler than the air around it. So the, the, the ambient air at the new higher altitude is still warmer than the air that you just lifted even um, as that air is cool, it's, it, that cooling air be, uh, becomes colder than the air around it. Well then that cooler air will tend to just sink back down. So that uh, we say that's stable because as the air is lifted, it gets cooler, and if it cools faster than the rate that the the uh, air cools that we observe with increasing altitude, then that uh, that vertical movement of air is likely to not go very far, or not st or, uh, stop um, before it goes very very tall, whereas if uh, the uh, if the air that gets lifted is um, ends up being warmer than the air around it, so if it cools, but the air around it is, or the rate of temperature change as you go up in altitude is even more, uh, then that air will be warmer than the air around it still, and it'll want to keep rising and keep rising. So we say that is unstable air because uh, anything that causes the air to want to go upward is uh, liable to make the air continue to go upwards. So we know that um, the, uh, the, ad the dry adiabatic lapse rate um, is 2 degrees Celsius per thousand feet. Um, but uh, what uh, the rate that the temperature goes down as we go up in altitude, uh, measuring the ambient air, not not air that's being lifted mm -hmm. uh, from a lower level, but just the ambient air around us, um, that lapse rate can be uh, very wide ranging. It can go anywhere from uh, maybe six degrees per thousand feet all the way to a negative value so the air actually gets warmer as you go up in altitude depending on that's why it's unsettled right unstable uh, uh, just dep depending on frontal activity or uh, solar heating other things uh, either uh, and also hu you know, humidity of the atmosphere at different levels can affect that as well but in any case uh, the difference between uh, the temperature of air, uh, a theoretical parcel of air that we lift a thousand feet mm -hmm. versus the actual temperature at that altitude a thousand feet higher, we call that the lifted index. And that is a uh, measure of how uh, stable or unstable the air is. So um, 
we'll probably see a figure for this later, but um, if the um, if the lifted index, um, for example, is zero, well, that just means if we lift a parcel of air a thousand feet, it's going to cool two degrees Celsius, and the air around it will also be two degrees Celsius, so they will be the same temperature. We would say that air has neutral stability. Um, if the uh, lifted index is, say, negative one, well, that means that the air around our parcel is now one degree cooler than uh, the air than the parcel that we lifted. Well, now our parcel is warmer, and now it wants to rise more, so a negative value is more unstable, whereas if it, the lifted index was, say, one, that means that if you lift that air and it cools, well, then the air around it is now one degree warmer, so that air just wants to sink back down. Um, and as I say, we'll encounter that a little bit later here, but um, there are uh, a number of different uh, figures here, uh, examples of uh, figures 12-1, 12-2, 12-3, uh, and 12-4, uh, talking about different kinds of stability or instability. So um, in figure 12-1, uh, well, that uh, air uh, is uh, stable all the way up. So you see um, at each point, um, the environmental temperature is always um, warmer than the um, temperature of the parcel of air that we've lifted. So we say that is absolutely stable. It will always want to return to the level that you uh, that it started at. Neutral stability uh, in Figure 12-2. Uh, well, in this case. Um, the air at the surface is the same. Uh, we have air 20 degrees Celsius at the surface. If you lift it 1,000 feet, well, that air is 17 degrees, but the air around it is also 17 degrees. So uh, that we say that air is neutrally stable, and that continues going upwards. 14 degrees at 2,000 feet, 11 degrees at 3,000 feet, um, and so that air, uh, whatever is lifting that air, be it uh, solar heating or frontal activity, it can lift that air, and that air won't resist being lifted, but it won't uh, be self-amplifying either. It'll just get lifted by however much the lifting force is, and that's it. So that's neutrally stable air. So it's fairly gentle. Fairly, yeah, that would be a fairly gentle example. Um, uh, in 12-3, we talk about uh, absolute instability, and that would be where, uh, in this case, so we once again we start with air at uh, 20 degrees Celsius. We lift it 1,000 feet, and uh, the uh, parcel of air goes down to 17, but the air around it is now at 16, so it wants to keep rising at 2,000 feet the parcel of air has gone down to 14, but the uh, the um, ambient temperature is 12. So uh, if, we, if we talk about that in terms of the lifted index, well, the lifted index um, at uh, 1,000 feet would be negative 1 because the, the uh, air around, the ambient air around is 1 degree cooler than our parcel of lifted air. Uh, at uh, 2,000 feet, the lifted index would be negative 2 because the ambient air is 2 degrees cooler than the, our parcel of lifted air. So the lifted air just uh, keeps on being warmer than the air around it, so it just keeps on wanting to go up and up and up, like a hot air balloon. Um, and then we have an example here in 12-4 um, called conditional stability, where uh, so at a thousand feet, our uh, lifted index, and in which they 
uh, have is our, just our temperature difference. Lifted index is another term for that. Um, our lifted index is plus one, so if we push the air up a thousand feet, it's still stable. At uh, two thousand feet, it's still plus one. Uh, so if we push it up two thousand feet, it's still stable. Same at three thousand feet. If we push it up four thousand feet, well now it's neutrally stable. Uh, and then if we Finally, if we push it up 5,000 feet, well, now we have a temperature difference or a lifted index of negative 1, which is unstable. So if the air gets lifted a little bit, it will, it's stable. It will return to its resting state. If it gets lifted a lot by like a very strong cold front or, say, a very strong thermal from a parking lot or something, it can possibly get to a level where... Uh, it will go from being stable to being neutral and finally being unstable. So that's why they say it's conditional stability because it's it's stable as long as you don't kick it too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you push it beyond a certain point, then it becomes unstable, uh, and that can have to do with uh, different ra uh, different rates of cooling. So if you uh, look at from surface to a thousand feet, it cools. Uh, in this case, two degrees from uh, 1,000 feet to 2,000 feet. Um, it cools three degrees from 2,000 to 3,000. It also cools three. 3,000 to 4,000 is three. Um, and uh, 4,000 to 5,000 is, is also uh, three, it looks like. So you have a pretty constant... Um, rate of temperature decrease uh, measured ambient with increase in altitude um, but the uh, the um, rate of cooling of the lifted air initially is is uh, three so it goes from 20 to 17. Uh, 17 to 14 at 2,000 feet. When it gets to 3,000 feet, the temperature and dew point meet, so it can't really, the air can't really cool much more. So because of that, it forms a cloud because it reaches its saturation point. But because of because it can't cool anymore because the temperature and the dew point are the same, well now you lift it. Uh, uh, another thousand feet, well now it only goes down two degrees mm -hmm. instead of three, and then same thing uh, beyond that. So at the base of a cloud, when, when air that's being lifted, lifted forms a cloud, the rate of temperature decrease as it uh, lifted will be less. And that's why we, we talk about, when we talk about standard laps here, we talk about the dry adiabatic lap here because if it's wet or if it's in this case saturated uh, well it can't cool as fast the rate of cooling decreases and therefore the air retains more heat as it goes up and it stays warmer than the air around it and that's our conditional instability example where if you lift it far enough past where it forms a cloud it'll start to stay warmer and uh, become unstable as that air gets lifted further and further. Does that mm -hmm. pretty much make sense? Yeah. yeah. Now, getting into some graphs here, so 12-5, um, if you uh, look at these red lines here in 12-5, that's the actual uh, uh, rate of uh, temperature decrease or the lapse rate that we observe. So um, if the temperature actually goes up with altitude, we say that's an inversion because usually the temperature goes down as we go up in altitude, but in some cases it can actually go up. For example, if we have a warm front above us um, with warm air pushing in over top of cold air, as you go up in altitude you can actually move into air that's getting warmer. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, uh, a temperature inversion is likely to lead to stable air because if the air gets lifted and the air, the, part, the lifted parcel of air gets cooler, 
but the air around is getting warmer, well then it's, got, it's gonna, yeah, it just wants to go back down. Um, if the temperature stays the same with uh, increase in altitude, so that's line F in 12-5 uh, here, um, then they, they say it's isothermal because that's the temperature stays the same. Once again, iso means the same. Thermal obviously is temperature. So the, uh, the air stays the same temperature as you go up in altitude. But again, that lifted parcel of air uh, is cooling as it goes up. So that'll still be stable because you're still going to find as that air goes up in altitude and it cools, it's still going to be cooler than the air around it. It still wants to sink back down. Now, um, uh, line E, uh, the temperature is going uh, down. So the, the what we say is the observed lapse rate, the, the actual decrease in temperature as we go up in altitude, um, the temperature is decreasing, but not very fast. So uh, the adiabatic lapse rate will still be greater than that, which means that as you lift the air, it'll cool, and it'll cool to a greater degree than the air around it, and it'll want to sink back down. Um, now the two lines here, they show line D and line B um, the, are the moist adiabatic lapse rate and the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So the dry adiabatic lapse rate, again, is that theoretical cooling of the air according to the ideal gas law. The moist adiabatic lapse rate is the rate of the, the uh, air will cool, as we said in the previous figure, after that condensation uh, occurs and the, the cloud forms so the air can't cool as quickly, so that keeps it warmer. So that's why the, uh, the moist adiabatic lapse rate doesn't decrease as quickly as the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So in line uh, C, which is in between those, uh, we see uh, that they say that's conditional stability because if the, uh, if the actual decrease in temperature with altitude is in between the dry adiabatic lapse rate and the moist or the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, then uh, the air will cool more the, the lifted parcel of air will cool more than the air around it until it becomes saturated. So it'll be stable until it hits that saturation point. Once it hits that saturation point, um, it'll stop cooling as quickly and it'll become unstable because it'll be retaining more heat as it continues to rise and become warmer than the air around it. So that zone between the dry adiabatic lapse rate and the moist adiabatic lapse rate that they have shaded in pink here is that area where you can have conditional stability that we talked about. Whereas anything below the dry adiabatic lapse rate is just going to be stable no matter what because as you lift the air, um, it's the... the uh, you mean unstable? You said stable. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, unstable. It's going to be unstable no matter what. Yeah, because as you lift the air, um, it will be uh, cooling less than the, uh, the air around it no matter what altitude you lift it to. So would this is different than violent thunderstorms, like where the fronts are banging each other. So is this just like a good rainstorm? What, as well, opposed to those fronts colliding and we get tornado warnings and stuff? Usually, is that kind of the difference? Usually, um, to get that really violent weather, um, what it's usually a combination of two things. You have strong frontal lifting, so you have that cold front coming through and lifting the air very violently combined with unstable air. So if the air is already unstable and you give it a really hard kick, well then it's just going to pop off really so strong. So this would be like a good spring rain uh, where we're creating, well, it's still unstable, right? right well, the, a good spring rain would be more in stable air. So um, 
because if you so you can have you can have stable air that's still giving you moisture and rain. Correct. Okay, I was thinking the instability is what causes the rain. Mm, it it certainly makes the rain more intense, but if you think about it, say a warm front, well the the air is getting lifted. Uh, it's not getting lifted very quickly, and as we talked about before, uh, with a warm front you have a temperature inversion mo uh, most of the time, and the uh, so it's stable. But it's still being it's still being lifted by the front, even though it's stable air, and so it will get to a point where it condenses and forms rain. But because it's stable, it won't keep on going beyond that and form taller and taller clouds and uh, thunderstorms. So the those flat clouds that you have in stable air uh, around a warm front, those can still produce rain, even though they're flat and uh, relatively thin but they're not going to produce uh, thunderstorms, you know, violent vertical movement of air, thunder and lightning because of all that friction. It's going to be a good rainstorm. Yeah, so stable air is more like a good soaker, mm -hmm. you know, steady rain. Unstable air is more likely to give you those violent thunderstorms, tornadoes, you know, severe weather. Okay. Um, and they talk in 12-6 here, uh, just sort of another way of visualizing that same thing. 12-7 would be a, just another way of visualizing conditional stability because you have uh, more stable air uh, underneath, less stable air above. So if you lift enough, it'll become unstable. Now, they talk about um, Dier figure 12-8 here, diurnal temperature variation. So uh, during the daytime as the sun is beating down on the ground and the ground is heating the, uh, heating the air, um, you will tend to have more, uh, a, a greater lapse rate because as the air next to the ground gets warmed, it gets warmed up more, and as you go up in altitude, the warming effect of the ground gets less and less significant, so that that air, as you go, the actual observed lapse rate as you go up from the ground is going to be pretty significant, because the air down at the ground level is, is getting warmed up, and as you move away from that, the temperature goes down really quickly. So, <clears throat> if you have a parcel of air when, when it's sunny and, you know, warm and sunny out, a uh, parcel of air gets lifted a little bit. Well, it's cooled adiabatically. Uh, again, that two degrees, if we lift it a thousand feet, the temperature of the parcel goes down two degrees. But let's say the temperature of the surrounding air is five degrees cooler because now you're not next to the ground, that warm ground anymore. Well, now that... Uh, that parcel of air that only cooled two degrees is three degrees warmer than the air that cooled five degrees and will tend to want to keep going up. So when it's sunny uh, and the, the ground is warming up the, uh, the air next to the ground, the air tends to be more unstable than if there's, let's say, a high overcast, which is limiting how much the, uh, energy the ground absorbs and how much the ground is warming up that air at low altitudes. So the, the actual temperature decrease with altitude is likely to be more moderate because there isn't that, mm -hmm. uh, heat, that, that, heat that heating up. from the bottom. And that's why um, when we get the really long sunny days as we start to get into summer, uh, it'll get bumpier in the summertime because with more sunlight shining down at a steeper angle, the ground warms up more, which tends to make the air more unstable, and you get more thermals and pockets of rising air. You get air. more spots where you got black and green and different colors, and all those are putting off different amounts of heat. And exactly, and that's and the when you have like a blacktop parking lot warming that air up a lot, uh, that makes the air near the ground very warm, the air away from the ground not so warm, which means that the the, uh, the lapse rate is very 
strong, which means that when you lift a parcel of air and it only cools adiabatically, it'll still be warmer, you get instability over things that produce a lot of heat. Bumpy air. Yep, bumpy air. So I might get sick this summer. <laughs> <laughs> on the plane. I hope not. Hope not. Uh, but, uh, you know, but if that happens, you know, we'll... Uh, Let's put the window open and stick my head out the window for a few minutes. Yep, and sometimes that's what you got to do. And finally, in uh, figure 12-9 here, um, they're getting to talking about the lifted index, uh, which is, again, the, the difference in temperature between the, lifted, the parcel of air that gets lifted and the temperature around it. And again, um, with a uh, lifted index that's negative, uh, you get uh, more unstable air, and lifted index that's positive is more stable. So the higher the higher the positive... Anything posit above zero is okay. Anything above zero uh, is going to be smoother, less bumpy, um, which is good for most people, but bad for glider pilots. Uh, yeah, they like the thermal yep. air. They like the thermal. Exactly. That's why they like the mountains. Yeah. So this whole thing, the science of it is is really cool. In in my head, I keep when you say parcel, I keep picturing this this cylinder of air. Yep. And then everything around it, and it just goes like this. Yep. But the temp, it's. I know it's not this hard cylinder, no. but depending on how the temperatures are and how the atmosphere is, it can stay pretty tightly. It can. And, and that would be like a big thermal, right? If that it's would, really tight. I mean, and, in the RC world, I've had friends tell me that they've had planes that broke in half in a thermal because it just destroyed them because yeah. it was so powerful. I never got that well, level of it. Uh, thermals usually aren't strong enough to damage or destroy full-scale airplanes, but certainly when you get a strong updraft like in a thunderstorm um, with that really unstable air uh, creating that, that strong lifting, um, that's when you get, again, as we talked about when we first talked about thunderstorms, you can get air uh, that's going up at, you know, five or 6,000 feet a minute, and then when it gets up uh, to uh, the top of the thunderstorm, it'll start, it'll spread out and start falling down again. Sometimes the falling air on the outside will get up to five or 6,000 feet a minute, so you can have a difference of 12,000 feet a minute at the edge of a thunderstorm, that can actually... Uh, rip. That'll mess a lot of things up. Yeah, that can rip full-scale airplanes apart, so that's why we stay away from thunderstorms. Um, speaking of uh, different kinds of clouds that are formed by different kinds of lifting and different kinds of uh, sources, um, there are uh, different types of clouds that we talk about. So. Um, in figure 13-1 here, I'm going to start from the bottom and work up. So stratiform clouds, um, stratus or stratiform, uh, when you say something is stratified, that means it's in a layer, or, la or layers, plural. Um, so that is sort of your flat, and uniform stable layer sheet of cloud for stable air, exactly. Um, so you see those around warm fronts um, and with stable air. Um, cumuliform clouds or cumulus clouds um, are those puffy, um, like we see in the summer, like you see in the summer, and those can develop eventually into thunderstorms depending on kind of like how. Florida. Exactly. There's you see, always puffy clouds down there, and, yep, and in the afternoon you get thunderstorms. Exactly, and that's because of that. Again, you get so much more sun down in Florida that warms up the air at the surface, you get unstable air, and it, as it lifts up... It's usually up, full of moisture, so it just exactly. makes it even more unstable. And then it just, uh, as, it, as it lifts up and gets gets some of that vertical movement going, uh, once it condenses, it sort of boils over into that puffy cloud, and that can uh, lead to those puffy, you know, uh, cotton-looking cumulus clouds, and then eventually if it gets lifted strongly enough, you get rain, uh, which leads us to our next kind of cloud, a nimbus cloud. And these different kinds of cloud names can sometimes be combined. So a nimbus cloud just means uh, a cloud that's producing rain. Uh, as it says here, the uh, word comes from Latin, as a lot of this does. But um, So a, a nimbus a cloud is a rain cloud, and you can have uh, 
So you can combine these. So you can have cumulonimbus a cloud is a cumulus cloud that's letting rain like out. Those the ones that drop rain at three o'clock every afternoon in Miami. Exactly. Uh, you can also have nimbostratus, which is like your flat sheet of clouds that's uh, giving you that nice, long, steady soaker of a rainstorm. That would be a, a nimbostratus cloud. It's a stratus cloud, but it's raining, so it's a, also a nimbus cloud. Nimbus. It's almost like we're making up words here. But they're, I've, I've seen all those, yep. so they're legit. And then um, the last one we have moving from bottom to top here is a cirrus or a cirriform cloud. A cirrus cloud is made of ice crystals instead of water droplets. So at very high altitudes, you get clouds that are actually made up of ice crystals. And those are those sort of very wispy clouds. The ones that way up there. That way up there that look like they're not moving at all. They just kind of yeah. hang around. Um, and those are ice crystal clouds rather than uh, water droplet clouds. You can also have um, uh, cloud names that are modified by the altitude that they're at. So you can have low-level clouds, uh, mid-level clouds, or high-level clouds. Um, now, they say low-level clouds surface up to about 6,500 feet, mid-level 6,500 feet up to 13,000 feet, and of course, uh, flying a chief, uh, it's about as high as we could ever get. Yeah. Is in we'll that probably stay in that there. low area. Yep. High clouds, you, you'll notice there's some overlap here too. High clouds can be anywhere from 10,000 feet up to 25,000 feet in polar regions or uh, temperate regions, and then, as they say, 16,500 up to 40,000. Tropical regions, so, you know, down in the Caribbean, for example, you could get uh, clouds up to 60,000 feet or more. Um, and the, the altitude at which the clouds stop um, is called the tropopause, because all of the... Uh, all of the weather that we typically experience in the atmosphere happens in the lowest layer of the atmosphere, which, which we call the troposphere. So the troposphere is where all of our clouds, our rain, all of that uh, typically uh, is confined to the troposphere. And that's because uh, when you get up to the top of the troposphere, which they call the tropopause, so uh, any, anytime you hear something pause, that usually means the top or the end of a certain region or uh, type of uh, area of the atmosphere. So when you get to the tropopause, uh, you're at the top of the troposphere and you move into the next layer of the atmosphere, which is the stratosphere. And uh, as you move up into the stratosphere, um, the, the rate of temperature decrease actually tends to uh, drop off. So you don't you don't, the temperature doesn't go down as quickly with altitude in the stratosphere as it does in the troposphere. And that means that as clouds um, get up to that level, um, at where the, uh, the uh, rate of temperature decrease goes down, um, or re rate of temperature decrease reduces, to be more clear, um, as the uh, it, it becomes stable because, as we said, you know, if you if you lift a parcel of air um, out of the troposphere and it cools, but the air in the stratosphere hasn't cooled, or the temp rate of temperature decrease in the stratosphere is less. Well, then that air that's cooled is now cooler than the air around it, and we have stable air suddenly. So uh, the uh, the stratosphere will almost always have stable air, and that's that's why we define the troposphere is essentially the layer of the atmosphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, is so the layer of the atmosphere where you're uh, likely to see uh, air that's unstable. Above the troposphere, air tends to be pretty stable. Not many planes get up there. Well, you can, depending on, you know, as 
as uh, you see here, um, so in polar regions, so up, you know, northern part of the U.S. into Canada, um, could easily be you, there. you can have a tropopause that's as low as 25,000 feet, and we, you know, airliners can go up to 40 or more, and even in temperate regions, the, the tropopause only gets up to about 40,000 feet, so uh, you can, you know, at the max, so airliners that fly at 40 or 41,000 feet, which is you know sort of the upper level of where airliners tend to fly, uh, can still get into the stratosphere in uh, temperate regions or tropical regions. You, see, you potentially you can still get into the stratosphere because you can see the uh, the uh, the range of the top of um, the uh, can be anywhere from twenty to sixty. Sixty, yeah. So. Um, so you can get uh, tropopause levels that are up, upwards of 60,000 feet in the tropics, which of course is higher than most any airliner is going to fly. Only military airplanes tend to get up that high. <clears throat> and uh, here, um, figure 13-1, they have a picture of some cirrus clouds. So those are those wispy mm -hmm. ice crystal clouds. Um, uh, now it also says here, um, points out that, as I said before, you can combine different, you know, mm -hmm. a, a cloud can have a characteristic of more than one type. So you can have, in theory, you can have cirrocumulus, which are cumulus clouds, so they're puffy clouds, but they're made out of ice crystals. So if you have strong lifting force at very high altitudes where the water is frozen, you can potentially have cumulus clouds that are made out of ice crystals. It's not very common, but it can happen. Um, so that's uh, figure 13-2 here, uh, it shows you a picture of that. 13-3, um, cirrostratus clouds um, are, again, they're high level clouds, so they're made of ice crystals, but in a very sort of uniform sheet, so they're stratus because they're a, a uniform layer, uh, cirrus because they're ice crystals. Um, uh, so up high level clouds are cirrus clouds, mid level clouds. Uh, mid level you have the uh, the word alto to denote mid level. So um, so they say here on uh, page 13-5 here uh, you can have alto cumulus. So those are mid level cumulus clouds. You can have uh, alto stratus. In Figure 13-4 here they show an, a uh, example of alto cumulus. So those are mid-level puffy clouds that are above where you usually see, you know, uh, low-level thunderstorms and stuff, but they're still puffy cumulus mm -hmm. clouds at those uh, middle levels. Um, I'll come back to 13 dash, figure 13-5 in just a moment here. Um, alto stratus um, is there are those mid-level clouds uh, in, a, in a layer, oftentimes those tend to be sort of uh, translucent, so sometimes you can actually see the sun through them. Uh, so if it's a very thin layer of, of clouds, but very uniform, um, that would be, th but sometimes, as they show in figure 13-7 here, they can be thicker, uh, so depending on how thick they are, they can be sort of that translucent quality. Or it can, the thicker ones can create just sort of those very gray, uh, gloomy days that aren't really raining. You don't really have low, kind of low clouds, and... just no, not even necessarily misty. Just the ones you want to sleep through. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then uh, getting into low level clouds, uh, you have your classic cumulus clouds in figure 13 8 here. Um, so those are those nice puffy little clouds you see oftentimes in the summertime. Towering cumulus is when those puffy clouds get a little bit taller. Uh, they're not producing rain yet, but they're getting, you know, they're not just the little wisps anymore. They're more, you know, big, heat big mound of clouds. So in figure 13-9, you see a, an example of that. Uh, when the uh, towering cumulus uh, gets a little taller, that's when you can have uh, uh, clouds that get into being 
uh, thunderstorms and uh, cumulonimbus clouds um, if they develop vertically just a little bit more than that. Uh, so a towering cumulus is not necessarily uh, an indicator of a thunderstorm, but it's an indicator that uh, there might be thunderstorms in the near future, depending on how unstable the, the air is. Um, and then uh, stratocumulus here, figure 13-10, is when you have a very sort of uniform layer of puffy clouds that sort of j almost join together. Um, 1311, you have your, your low-level stratus clouds. So those are those like gray, really misty kind of days that you talked mm -hmm. about a minute ago where it's just kind of misty, low, gray clouds, just very gloomy outside. You, know, you want to sleep through it. And uh, you get cumulonimbus here, figure 1313. Uh, this one does not have an anvil, so when the, uh, when the cumulonimbus cloud gets to the point where it's actually going up and it's hitting that tropopause, um, hitting that layer of stable air above it in the stratosphere, it can't go up anymore so it starts to spread out and you get those thunderstorms that sort of overhang outwards at the top mm -hmm. and pull those an anvil head. And in figure 13-14 here you can see that, that uh, uh, cumulonimbus cloud has developed vertically and it, you can sort of clearly see in this picture where it's hit the highest level it can get to at the top of the troposphere and it's just sort of spread out and you can see that uh, part that's overhanging and uh, but you can safely assume that uh, if that air is rising in the middle and spreading out to create that anvil head then around the edges of that anvil head you have air that's sinking usually you can have very strong downdrafts underneath Usually not a good thing when you see one. No, and you can also potentially have hail if if uh, hail is formed when uh, you have a raindrop that gets lifted by an updraft up to the point where it freezes, becomes an ice pellet, and then goes back down again, uh, gets more water sticking to it, gets lifted by another updraft, freezes again. And the more of these up and down cycles you have, the bigger of a hailstone you get. So it's going on a crazy roller coaster ride. Exactly, until finally you get a hailstone that's big enough that it can overcome the updrafts and it falls down out of the, usually comes out of those anvil heads uh, as, it, as it gets. Then it looks like snow in the summer. Yep, pretty much. Okay, question for you. And this is, I don't know if it relates to what we talked about last week or some mm -hmm. of the stuff this week. We talked the last time about how the thunder and the the friction yep. causes the lightning and the yep. thunder and the charged particles. What causes that lightning that's just like from cloud to cloud? You know, like you can, I don't know, I think we call it sheet lightning, where you're, mm -hmm. you know, it's way off in the distance and it's just dancing between the clouds and it's never hitting the ground. And mm -hmm. what what's the atmosphere doing up there that's not just, it's calm down here? What what makes that happen? It's just it's a science thing. Well, so um, when you, I think you're sort of talking a little bit about two different things. So the first thing is when you have lightning up at higher altitude, but you don't have any violent weather at the ground, um, that can be because you have a, potentially you can have a stable layer of air at the ground and it gets unstable as you go upwards. So that might be a, a conditional stability situation where uh, it's stable at the ground, so you're not having a lot of wind and updrafts. So once you get up there, it's doing all of its crazy movements, but yep. it's confined into this ceiling. Sure. This little, yep. its own little container up there. Right. Now, the next thing you talked about, so when, it when lightning goes from cloud to cloud. Um, it appears in, to. In, <laughs> well, it, no, it, and it does. Okay. Um, it really does. Uh, if it, so there's two types of lightning. There's cloud to cloud lightning and cloud to ground lightning. So cloud to cloud lightning happens when you have an electric charge uh, created by air movement, a static electric charge created by air movement, and uh, some distance away you have uh, air that has 
uh, the opposite charger doesn't have that static charge and the the uh, it wants to equalize the electric charge between mm -hmm. where there's like the ground does right so uh, if for some reason it's not s strongly enough attracted to the ground to uh, s for the electricity to escape it'll sometimes escape to another area of the atmosphere uh, or another cloud hmm. so that's where you have cloud to cloud so lighting. would one of those clouds be more like of a dry air drier air as opposed to the because usually yes. I associate static electricity with the winter when it's really dry and I drag my feet across the floor mm -hmm. and I touch my computer or something and it hurts. Yeah, so that that could very well be that uh, you have uh, a cloud that has less moisture content um, and a cloud that has more moisture content and the... Uh, the, the charges could be different. The charges can be different, and you get one, to... one cloud striking another. Okay. I just um, was wondering how that happens up there, because sometimes you can sit out on a summer night, and you can look yep. off, and you just see this. It's like a light show up there, but it's perfectly cool where you're yep. at. Yep. And then the other uh, aspect of that, uh, which we sometimes call heat lightning. That's what I was thinking about, is heat lightning. Heat lightning is uh, where you have a thunderstorm that could be... 50 miles or 100 miles away, but um, because the atmosphere is so humid, the light refracts through the atmosphere through uh, humid air better than it does through dry air. So light conducts better through humid air as long as there isn't a cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so you have the light refracting from one droplet to the next, and it can go a very long distance. So you can have uh, light that's being refracted and bent over the horizon. So, so it really isn't lightning. Well, it is. It is. Oh, it's just it's being reflected it's, through it's, the particles. Right. So it's, it, it is lightning, it's but it's... kind of it, lights the clouds up. It's lightning that's so far away that it's below the horizon. But the clouds are the, but reflecting the, the, it through. The air, or the, the, uh, the humid air, is bending that light around so that you can see the lightning okay. even when Very cool. uh, you can't actually see the cloud itself. Science at work. Yep. Very cool. So, and that's why when you have heat lightning, usually you don't have thunder because it's so far away that you just can't hear the thunder. Yeah, it dies out by the time it gets to you. Exactly. Were you going to come back to this 13.5? Oh, yeah. Um, so, there, uh, we were talking earlier about the air, air that flows up a mountainside and uh, condenses near the top. Mm -hmm. So when when the air comes to the top of the mountain, it condenses, it creates a cloud, but when it goes down on the far side of the mountain, it warms up again, and the, the water vapor uh, disperses into the air again, so you don't have a, you know, a cloud. So it can create uh, sort of a almost a standing wave of clouds over the top, over the very top of the mountain, which, so as the air comes up, it forms a cloud, uh, and then, or the, the uh, air precipitate, or the air, the water vapor condenses out of the air, and as the air goes back down and warms up, the uh, water vapor uh, evaporates back into, or the, the, con the water droplets that have condensed evaporate back into water vapor and the cloud disappears so you can appear to have this uh, this picture is like a donut on top exactly, of the mountain. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's a cloud where uh, it it just stays, it, or it appears to stay on top of the mountain even though the air is moving. It's a constantly evolving cloud because the air exactly. is moving through there and it's exactly. collecting and going away. Exactly. It's just depending on the temperatures yeah. it just stays kind of right there. Right, uh, very much like a standing wave in a river, where it's a wave can look like it's just you know a wave in the water that's staying still, but the water in the river is flowing through it. Um, but the, it's usually because there's an obstruction it's underneath. Usually, yeah, usually which is exactly it. what that's doing because yep. air literally is a fluid. Very much. So. so it's basically just a standing wave in the air that you can see because it's making a cloud. So we've talked about uh, 
nimbus clouds, clouds that produce rain. We've talked a little bit about hail. So um, as the water vapor condenses out of air and it, uh, it um, creates little water droplets that make a cloud, uh, as that process continues, those water droplets stick to each other and they get bigger and bigger. Um, and you can have uh, raindrops form. And then as they get, when they get big enough, you have a, a blob of water that's big enough to overcome the, mm -hmm. the uh, updraft and it falls as rain. Now we already talked about how if those get pushed up by a strong enough updraft, they can go up high enough they can freeze and then come down, collect more water back up and freeze again. That creates hail. Um, snow is basically uh, when you have a, a cloud that's uh, in the wintertime where uh, it's cold enough that you're not going to have water condense uh, because it's, it's uh, already below freezing. But you can have, uh, we talked about how you can have condensation, you can also have deposition where water vapor goes directly into ice crystals without becoming water in between. So a snowflake uh, usually uh, forms around some microscopic little grain of dust in the atmosphere and the water vapor will deposit on that grain of dust and grow and create a snowflake. And when enough uh, ice or frost accumulates on that tiny little grain of dust uh, to create a snowflake that's big enough to overcome uh, updrafts, then it falls down as snow. So there you have rain, you have hail, you have snow. Um, sleet or ice pellets would just be basically, uh, could turn into hail if they went up and down a few more times to get bigger, but uh, in the case of you know ice pellets, or uh, sleet, that would usually just be um, uh, droplets that freeze and then just fall right away. So tiny little hail, They don't go up and down. They just don't go up and down. Uh, you can also have freezing rain, where you have raindrops that come down into cooler, you have a warmer layer above, like in a situation of a warm front, and you have rain that comes down, it falls into colder air, and when it uh, hits the, if the ground is cold, um, you can have uh, raindrops that hit and freeze to, the, you know, if the ground is below freezing and a raindrop hits it, well, the raindrop, you know, the water is going to freeze when it hits the ground. Um, and we talked about how snowflakes and raindrops typically grow uh, around a tiny, tiny little uh, grain of dust or something, mm -hmm. some sort of nucleus. Well, if by chance you have a raindrop that, that just grows uh, without uh, much of a grain of dust, which can happen occasionally, uh, then if that raindrop gets cooled below freezing, there's no nucleus for the freezing process to start around, so it can actually remain liquid below the usual freezing temperature of water, and then we call that supercooled water. Um, and if uh, water that is supercooled hits anything, then what it hits will become a nucleus for it to freeze, and it'll instantly turn into ice. Um, I think I've heard the weather guys talk about that a couple yeah. of times. And that can be a particularly nasty type of freezing rain, or it can also stick to aircraft, and we call that SLD icing, or supercooled large droplet icing, where uh, those those supercooled droplets, as soon as they hit the airplane, just instantly freeze, and that can be really, really nasty as far as icing on an airplane goes. Yep. Um, Ice and planes don't mix well. No. No. So uh, in uh, figures 14-1 through... Uh, 14-5 here, you show they show different uh, scenarios that can form uh, rain, uh, snow, uh, sleet, regular rain, freezing rain. Just depends on what the profile of the temperature is. If the temperature uh, 
for example, in 14-2 uh, here, um, if the temperature stays below freezing all the way down, you have snow. Mm -hmm. If the temperature starts cold and then warms up above freezing and then uh, cools down again, you typically will get uh, ice pellets or, or a sleet. And then uh, figure 14-4, um, you have uh, precipitation that falls, maybe initially as snow, turns into rain, and then if it's, if it's above freezing most of the way down, but uh, below freezing just right at the surface, then you have that freezing rain. And then if it stays above freezing most of the way down and it's above freezing at the ground as well, then you just have regular rain. And there you have it, we can be meteorologists now. So uh, just to sum up what we've talked about here, um, different kinds of clouds, you can have um, cumulus clouds, you can have stratus clouds, you can have nimbus clouds, which, which can also combine with either the other two. Um, you can have cirrus clouds, which are made of ice crystals, um, different kinds of clouds. You saw lots of different pictures of different kinds of clouds and then uh, different kinds of precipitation. So you can have rain, you can have snow, you can have sleet, freezing rain, hail, all those different kinds of uh, precipitation that come out of the clouds. And uh, those are, in a nutshell, uh, the types of clouds that we can see and the types of uh, stuff that can come out the bottoms of them.